Thank you for downloading Children's Podcast. My name is Jimmy Bellamy, and this week my guest is Dr. Daniel Lagrange, a world-renowned eating disorders expert and UCSF Benioff Professor of Children's Health in San Francisco. Dr. Lagrange is joined by Drs. Julie Lesser and Beth Brandenburg of the Center for the Treatment of Eating Disorders here at Children's, and the three doctors and I have a conversation about eating disorders and the myths involved, the treatments involved, how a family member's role is important in the help and the treatment of eating disorders. There was so much to talk about, and Dr. LaGrange's time was limited. He has been making a lot of appearances while here in Minnesota, and I was appreciative of the time he and Drs. Lesser and Brandenburg were able to provide. We had a, a great conversation with a lot of helpful info for people who are suffering from an illness involving an eating disorder or a, a family member or a friend of or a teacher of somebody involved. A lot of valuable information is, is in this episode, and I, I had a great conversation. I hope you enjoy it too. You can find us on the web at childrensmn.org. We're on Twitter, at Children's MN. Leave us a note there, ask a question, and we'd be happy to address it in a future show. And you can find the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, Vimeo, and YouTube. And if you're on, if you're on iTunes, uh, rate, review, and subscribe to the show. That helps us out. So enjoy this episode on eating disorders with doctors Daniel LaGrange, Julie Lesser, and Beth Brandenburg. And I'd be remiss if my first question wasn't, what brings you to children's? Uh, the um, goodwill of my colleagues sitting at that end, Drs. Lesser and Brandenburg, uh, but more seriously, well, that too, of course, but uh, children's uh, received um, a private donation to support and grow the eating disorders program. And uh, both uh, Julie and Beth um, have been at the forefront uh, of, of uh, implementing evidence-based treatment in the practice of their work here and uh, wanted to take that one step further and uh, build the research infrastructure around their clinical service delivery so that we could uh, do an effectiveness study uh, of the work that they're providing here at Children's. And what else are you doing while you're here? As little as possible because they keep me pretty busy. Um, that's really the only reason I'm here uh, is to uh, uh, continue to meet with my colleagues here at Children's to continue to build uh, a strong relationship between this program and uh, our program at UCSF and to um, have a lot of uh, meetings with the uh, team while I'm here to to refine the research piece that I'm primarily responsible for, as I said, that's built into the, the clinical work that they primarily responsible for. And is this your first time in Minnesota? Oh, no, 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 not at all. I lived in San, in San Francisco. I live in San Francisco now, but I lived in Chicago for 17 years, and I've had long-standing collaborations uh, with colleagues at the U, uh, still ongoing. And for those meetings, I uh, for those collaborations, I have been visiting Minnesota for the past 15 years, probably. This is my second visit to Children's, specifically for this project, although uh, Julie and Beth had me over for the spring update the year before, uh, which is part of Children's as well. So this is probably then my third Children's specific visit. Okay. Yeah. This is a topic that interests me a great deal because there is so much about it, and sometimes it's hard to find out or know what's accurate. So what, what are some of the myths that we commonly hear about eating disorders? I guess the biggest one probably is that it's self-inflicted or it's a choice uh, and or it's, it's it's a fad and you can just snap out of it. Uh, those are very common myths and I think they have the terrible consequence of uh, children and families are getting blamed for having done this uh, as opposed to us looking at this as an illness that is as much out of your control as just about every other illness. And uh, 
And I think so. That's that's the one uh, myth that I think is very pervasive. The other is that that families are causing eating disorders. If if it's not the adolescent who's chosen to do this, uh, it is probably the parents who have caused this uh, in the first instance. And I think the consequence of that myth is that families are very often and until today. Uh, uh, blamed for having caused the child's illness and as a, as a result should not be involved in treatment because if you're the cause of the illness, how can you be part of the solution? Uh, and I think those two uh, myths um, are certainly very much still in place today. Despite the work that we've been doing over many years to try and, and um, um, counter these myths, uh, certainly the lay public uh, keep the myth of, of this is self-inflicted by the adolescent alive and well, and sadly many of our colleagues in the eating disorders field keep the issue of parents being responsible for this illness alive and well. And I imagine it, it's difficult, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, it's difficult to make progress on healing and on improving if there's so much blame that's being gone through, whether it's internally by a family member right. or by the person directly suffering from it. Right. Yeah, I think that's a good point. It, it often gets in the way, and certainly it has to be addressed up front by us as, as clinicians to uh, help um, disabuse the families of the idea that they caused the illness. Because if you if you carry that guilt or own that blame, you would, as a consequence of that, probably be quite reluctant to step in there and and do what we would often advise families to do, and that is, of course, be a part of the solution. It requires uh, a, an active engagement and involvement on their part. And if you belabored with guilt of having caused it, you think probably you're going to make things worse if you stay involved. So parents tend to back off uh, as, as a as a response to that guilt. And a lot of what we do in treatment is to try and encourage them to get, to re-engage uh, and, and, and help them um, reduce that guilt. We live in this world now where people love to combine words and make new words. And one word that I'm not a big fan of is the term I hear occasionally, manorexic, like anorexic is exclusive to women somehow. Um, this is an illness that affects all, all ages, yeah. all genders. Right. Uh, talk, uh, talk about how yeah. it's not necessarily what someone may have in their mind as a perception. I, I share your your dislike for these made up terms, and, and that's that's a new one. I haven't even heard that one. There are a couple of others. Uh, we tend to stick to what DSM uh, tells us, uh, which is anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, and then a couple of others. And these made up ones are usually uh, really sort of just, um, um, well, they're not, they're not applicable in the sense that they're not being endorsed or described by DSM. Uh, so I can, see, I can see the need why some people would want to look for a word to, to describe males with anorexia because um, manorexia is what you said, right? Um, yeah because the illness is often perceived as a female-only disorder, which of course is not the case. Um, there, there are several ways in which one can answer that question. If you look at the clinical population of uh, the adolescents between, say, the ages of 13 and 18, certainly most clinics would tell you that uh, eight out of every 10 cases would be female, sometimes nine out of every 10 cases would be female. That said, which, which can let you to believe that this is a disorder that really only happens uh, in females or presents in females. But if you look at younger kids, say between the ages of 8 and 12, uh, that number is, is not so skewed. It's still a bit skewed in favor of females, but closer to 6 out of every 10 or 7 out of every 10, certainly not 9 out of every 10. And then the third piece of that uh, uh, question or the f third answer to that would be if you look at large population-based surveys of uh, lifetime prevalence of all eating disorders in the United States among teenagers between ages of 13 and 18, uh, the number of boys is almost as high as the number of girls presenting with an eating disorder. And that probably begs the question, what happens between diagnosis and presenting for treatment? And is there something in the way we go about diagnosing or presenting for treatment that is more gender specific than the actual disorder 
in itself, that if a boy has an eating disorder, the pediatrician might be more inclined to think of a host of other diagnoses before they say finally go, oh, well, I, I didn't really want to think about this because you're a uh, of this diagnosis because you're a boy and this is really a girl's illness, so eventually I'll settle with this diagnosis if you like. And even within the eating disorders community, if we if we come to to uh, embrace the idea that this is a disorder that only happens in females, you would be inclined not to give that diagnosis even when the facts are st staring you in the face. So the point is that there are probably far more boys out there with an eating disorder than we sometimes think. And when you're looking at, as whether you're a parent, a friend, a teacher, someone in the life of someone you may suspect is suffering mm. from eating, eating disorder, what, what are symptoms that those people can look for? Um, if your friend um, talks more about food and weight and shape than they used to, if they um, begin to avoid social engagements that uh, revolve around eating because they don't want to be seen to be eating, if they um, stop uh, taking the bus to school but would rather walk the four or five blocks, um, when they, of course, begin to look very uh, emaciated, uh, which often is not an early sign, but sadly a more advanced sign. But our patients are very good at, at hiding their symptoms because they don't want others to learn that they might have a disorder. So they would wear baggy clothes and, and hide the fact that they are skeletal. So that's a more more difficult early sign. Uh, so that's on the weight loss side. On the on the bulimia nervosa side, um, when um, when large amounts of food go missing, uh, when your friend uh, tends to go to the bathroom every time you eating, you go to a restaurant after the movies at the mall, and halfway through the pizza, uh, she disappears in the bathroom. Uh, those would be telltale signs that maybe that person is trying to get rid of the food that they've eaten, uh, or you. You see your friend exercising excessively or beyond the point that, that they typically would. Instead of running a casual two miles three times a week, they're now doing an hour and a half seven days a week. Uh, those are probably some of the signs that I would, would begin to worry about. That doesn't mean that just because you exhibit those signs it, that you all of a sudden have an eating disorder, but those are probably signs that would have me sit up and say, maybe I should ask a few more questions here. Sometimes you might see um, kids being more isolative or seeming kind of down, depressed, less interested in school or their usual activities. A lot of changes in food choices, mm. not wanting to eat foods that previously were fine. I, I, yes. Susie used to like a chocolate chip cookie and all of a sudden that's no longer on the list of things that she would eat, things that you used to like and then begin to cut them out. What are some of the different types of treatments for eating disorders? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, if we have four hours, I can certainly <laughs> give you a, a long list of those. Uh, but uh, all, all jokes aside, um, if we just let's just focus the conversation on adolescence. This is a children's hospital, and we mostly, although not exclusively, work uh, with uh, children between the ages of say uh, ten and twenty. Um, there, there are unfortunately very few treatments for which we have uh, reasonable or even solid uh, research and clinical evidence of, of their efficacy. So we, we're quite restricted as clinicians how best to intervene. Um, if someone is medically unstable, then they need to be in the hospital to, uh, to be stabilized. Uh, and there are very clear and, and uh, good protocols uh, across centers to, to do just that. And that's prob probably the least debatable part of, of, of what, we, what we do when it comes to treatment for these patients. But if someone has anorexia nervosa and is medically stable and presents for outpatient treatment, uh, then family-based treatment is, is one treatment for which we have uh, quite solid evidence of its efficacy, which means that the parents are engaged to do the work that the nurses would have if that child was admitted to a specialist inpatient eating disorder treatment facility. So it's really helping the parents to do what they typically would want to do, which is to rescue and help and support their kid through uh, through this uh, dilemma. Um, there are So that's a family treatment. There, there are some individual therapies for which there's much less, inf uh, less evidence available, but nevertheless it would be good alternatives should the former not be available. Adolescent focus therapy comes to mind. There's some preliminary evidence uh, for the efficacy or effectiveness of, of cognitive behavioral therapy for that patient population. Uh, 
but that's about it. Medication plays a very small role because we have no studies to support uh, that medication in, in by itself would help with anorexia. There's certainly uh, medications that would help with comorbid disorders, and many of our patients present with anxiety and depression, but that's somewhat separate to the eating disorder. For Julie, wanted to add something? Well, I wanted to ask a question that follows up on the idea of myths that may be barriers to getting an effective mm -hmm. treatment such as family-based mm -hmm. uh, treatment because I, I think sometimes families know something about it, maybe call it the Maudsley method, mm -hmm. but I've heard families say, well, wouldn't that just be we become the police mm -hmm. of the food? And so I feel as if it's really important to get information out about how effective this treatment is and the, the key components of family okay. base, and maybe Dr. Lagrange could talk a little about that. So uh, the, the, I guess the first point you make is do parents in family-based treatment become the food police? Um, I, I don't like that, those two words next to one another, uh, because I think no treatment should should embody the idea of someone becoming the food police. Is some, is, isn't it akin to the dentist becoming the root canal police or the filling police and the, the pediatric oncologist becomes the chemotherapy police? It's, it's, food is medicine because if someone is severely starved and there's no medical reason for why they're so underweight, the only medicine, if you like, that works uh, and that brings them back to health would be food at a specific dose and intensity of X number of calories, X number of times a day uh, for X number of months for the foreseeable future. Um, and if the parents, if your child has a, has a particular illness that requires them administering a certain uh, cough syrup or antibiotic at a certain uh, frequency and intent, uh, dose uh, prescription X number of times a day for the next seven days, you don't call the parents the antibiotic police. Yet they, they do exactly what we're asking parents in this illness to do, which is to make sure to implement this treatment at this frequency, at this dose, for this long. Uh, and I, so, so if you want to call it food police, then so be it. Then let's describe the oncologist as chemotherapy police and the uh, dentist the, uh, the filling police. When, uh, but right, when usually we think of that as care. Right. So it, it right. is interesting that somehow right. it gets almost a this negative idea yeah. attached to it, which doesn't right. really fit at all with what it is like to do it. Right, and, and if so. we want to then continue the theme of myths, I think the, the myth is that, that for all pediatric disorders, medical or psychiatric, parents are highly engaged and involved in the child's care. I, I, I'm sure that there's no oncologist who would pursue treatment if the parents were abdicating any responsibility to be actively engaged in making sure that the treatment is implemented and applied as prescribed. Part of this history and myth, if, if you like then, in eating disorders is that parents have caused this disorder, therefore they should stay away from the treatment, which then if you get them to be involved, you call them the food police. I think those are, as, as Dr. Lesser points out, uh, myths that are really kind of permeating our treatment efforts and get a lot of parents to back off and a lot of clinicians to shy away from, from prescribing a dose of calories that would actually get the job done. So. Um, yes, they, parents may be called the food police, may be reluctant to want to be the food police, but if food police means you care about your child, you follow your gut feeling to intervene when your child is starving themselves, then I'll settle for the words food police. But I'd like to call it something else, like Dr. Lesser says, it's called care, concern, and appropriate engagement with rescuing your child from an illness that can't kill them. And why is that family involvement important? I, that again, I think has a very simple, straightforward answer. I can we can certainly entertain your audience with a seven-hour-long discussion, but <laughs> I can give you a seven-minute one, or a six-minute, or seven-second one. How about six seconds? Seven seconds. Parents second. care for their children. No one loves and cares for their children more than parents do, and their gut tells them that if my kid's not eating, I need to help and support them here, otherwise they're going to die. Uh, in the same way, if they fall and break a leg, they'll pick them up and take them to the nearest ER and make sure that the orthopedist will set their, their broken limb again. And the parents' instinct remains the same. It's, it's, what worries me is when we make this exception that around anorexia nervosa, for some reason, the parents ought not to be following the gut instinct, which is to step in and take care of their child. 
And a question for everybody here is, what sets the Center for the Treatment of Eating Disorders apart from other programs? I think that as clinicians, we took a look at what are the leading treatments and wanted to make them available and let families have a choice because there are situations in which it's one or the other treatment, whether it's family-based treatment or a cognitive behavioral therapy, a more individual treatment, are a better fit for a family. But no matter what, we want to make sure that if we're going to deliver a treatment that we do it really well and don't miss key parts. Um, I think there's another myth, which is if um, a family believes that they've talked about family-based therapy, that they've actually had a full course of it, which is often a misconception as well. I think there are key phases and interventions that we do, and as a program here at Children's, we wanted to make sure that our outcomes match what's been uh, published in the research centers and that we work closely with the treatment developers to make sure that we're really delivering these treatments well. I would just add that um, here at Children's we view families as the best resource to help their uh, young people overcome their eating disorders and the Children's Hospital is a great place for a patient with a really severe eating disorder because of all the resources, all of the specialists, the nurses have been highly trained and we can really provide a comprehensive treatment program. Okay. And can I add something to yes, that? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that what really sets children apart from uh, other um, treatment facilities outside the so-called ivory tower, I think in, maybe this is true for many other disorders, is often the divide between what happens in tertiary training facilities treatment-wise and what happens in what people often refer to as the real world. And they, they often, sadly, is a, a divide or a gap between what happens in these two settings. Uh, this is certainly the first time that I've worked with folks outside a, a tertiary uh, a treatment center uh, that uh, would implement, as Dr. Lesser uh, uh, referred to as evidence-based treatments very meticulously uh, and to the greatest degree of fidelity and, and I think that children's ought to be uh, complimented for uh, doing just that. I know we're running low on time. Is there anything we want to cover before we go? I wonder if Dr. LaGrange could say something about how malnutrition itself can trap a person and make it hard for families uh, when this occurs in their, with, with one of their loved ones. And why it is that mm. it is important to address right. malnutrition. I think that question is, is often best answered by uh, going right back to the U here in Minneapolis, a study that was done in the 1950s, early 1950s. Uh, by colleagues at the University of Minnesota um, where healthy adult males who uh, were conscientious objectors to the war participated in a self-starvation study. Um, and the outcome of the study was if you have healthy individuals, no medical or psychiatric histories, and they are starved, that they present with a lot of the symptoms, in, uh, both uh, medical and psychological, that we see in our adolescents who are starved. And when they were refed, most of those symptoms disappeared. Uh, and there was a very helpful uh, guide for the way we treat patients today and why reversing self-starvation is so critically important. Most of the symptoms and signs that we observe in our patients whether they're 13, 14, or 15. If they severely starve, their brains don't work the way they used to work. So they become obsessed about the next pound they're going to lose. They can think of nothing else but the next calorie, calorie that they can cut. And these often being bright kids who are fairly uh, or quite rational up until that point uh, are convincing their parents that they are fully in control of this process. And parents don't appreciate, often don't appreciate the degree to which uh, the brain is impacted by the level of starvation. So they try and reason with their child to eat more or to, uh, to uh, buy into the adolescent convincing the parents that leave it to me, I'll take care of this, I promise I'll eat more. And it's so easy, we can see why it's so easy for parents to want to go that way, uh, that route in terms of letting the adolescent take charge 
charge of this. Uh, in family-based treatment, at least, uh, parents are given a lot of information about how starvation impacts the brain and how that in, in, uh, in turn impacts behavior, and that we cannot reason or argue with the adolescent who's so starved. The best way to address that would be to reverse the starvation as quickly as possible, both for medical reasons, because these kids often present as medically unstable, but also because it gets the brain to work again. And then you can actually engage the adolescent in a more rational way around food and, and, and body image and uh, healthy re-engagement with adolescents. Thank you. And is, is there anything you guys would like to add before we go? And how can a family get a hold of you two as well um, if, they, if they... And how does that even work? Is it, is it the family that reaches out? Is it the person suffering from the illness who reaches out? How does it normally happen? In our program, a lot of times it's the pediatrician who's the first to see the signs with the family and make the referral. Although families do find us um, sometimes through the organizations such as FEAST or Maudsley Parents where people who provide a treatment such as family-based treatment are, are listed. I wanted Dr. Brandenburg to answer a question about our inpatient unit. We are one of the programs that um, does a more rapid refeeding, which I think is important with what Do Dr. LaGrange was saying for addressing the starvation and not s keeping somebody in the hospital for a long period of time, which causes a lot of disruption to family life. But I think it would be helpful to hear from Dr. Brandenburg about why it is so hard to refeed kids and why it takes more than you can imagine. To oh, I think that's a great question. Um, so it's another kind of going back to myths about eating disorders is that sometimes families think if their kid just goes back to eating more normally, like how they were before they got into a starved state, that they would regain weight. Um, but that's really not true. And one of the things that we learned from the starvation study that Dr. LaGrange was referring to at the U many, many years ago was that people who are malnourished or starved typically need around 4,000 calories per day to regain weight. And that's really about two times as much as what a normal person would eat. Um, and so this is a very difficult task that we're giving patients and families is to, re to regain weight is actually quite difficult and takes a lot of work on the um, part of both the child and the parents. And when patients are in the hospital, you know, we have the help of dietitians and close medical monitoring to make sure that this is done safely. But our goal is really to have hospitalizations be short and to teach patients and families how to continue to do this and to get well and fully recovered while at home without disrupting their life in other ways. Great. I appreciate the time, and we could go on and on about this. I have so many questions. Well, we can read likewise. <laughs> I hope you enjoy the rest of your time in Minnesota, and I hope to be able to talk to you guys again, too. We have one more question for Dr. LaGrange. There you go. What is your favorite Minnesota expression? Thanks a bunch. I don't think I'm guilty of saying that. <laughs> I could be wrong, but I don't think I, I... I say other silly Minnesota things, but I don't think I say that. I wanted to say one more thing about our clinic, too. Absolutely. Okay. Although we're here at a children's hospital, the eating disorders, and they typically start during childhood or adolescence, but they might recur throughout the lifespan. So we see patients of all ages. It's important, though, to try to get effective treatments early in life to try to prevent a more chronic illness. In our program, we do work with adults as well as children and teenagers, and I think our age span has been from 5 to 75. Okay. Thank you very much, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Thank, Thank you. you. Nice to meet you. Thanks a bunch. Thanks. Are you welcome? <laughs>